you can't be an environmentalist and eat meat. So the vegan as he steps into a plane. You can't possibly live sustainably and drive a car, says a cyclist as she tucks into a burger. Do you see where the irony is? We are all hypocrites of climate change. Ever heard the argument that climate activists are hypocrites because they still consume meat, or still purchase from fast fashion industries, or still use and use plastics? I here for once have felt that. Sometimes people I go out with would point out, why are someone drinking out of a plastic bottle? I thought you were an environmentalist. In fact, I just emitted around 6,480 grams of CO2 emissions from driving 54 kilometers from my house to here, just to talk about climate change. And that burden follows me around every single day, ever since I started my activism in the climate movement. So going back when I was 15 years old, me and my other two friends started our own grassroots environmental organization here in our country, which grew over 150 young people joining our organization and advocating for the same issue of climate change. Now, what I realized is that most of our members, and I myself, whenever we associate, our, associate ourselves with the terms, you know, climate activists or environmentalists, people were always expecting us to perform perfect environmentalism, as if joining a certain movement to support its cause meant that you were also carrying this personal burden of having to excel and conquer at every individual level path of climate action. Whether it's being vegan or going plastic free or using public transport. At first I thought that you know this pressure from constant hypocrisy for, for not wanting to be a climate hypocrite is somewhat a motivation for people to live more sustainably, that this was the ultimate reverse psychology to push people towards sustainability by using guilt trip or even shame. But was that really the cause? Now, Emma Thompson, an actress, flew to join the strike and address protesters and also give a few media interviews on the climate strike. As it turned out, however, we can see that the media has portrayed a whole different story. Dame Emma jets 5,400 miles just to show how green she is. Or Emma Thompson admits that she's a hypocrite for flying around the world just to show that she's advocating for climate change. The accusation of hypocrisy can be very simply. It gets thrown away in a moralistic tone as if it had to do anything with our morals towards the issue. Did Emma Thompson really do anything worse than the other millions of other people who take flights but don't receive the same criticism? The central misconception is this. One doesn't need to stop using the oil that fuels today to argue for change tomorrow. For example, demanding better schools doesn't mean that parents have to completely stop sending their children to school, right? So the bottom line is that we have to be inside the system to change it. Now, in Indonesia itself, the biggest contributors um, to our climate doom or climate catastrophe is two coal mine sectors that have wrecked our Indonesia's health for over decades by failing policies and also oligarchies, which is the energy and forest sector. And so in today's case of climate change, none of us would try to argue that individual change or individual action is enough to really dismantle these two powerful strong sectors. We need more. So frankly, we aren't also limited to individual action. Changing your behavior matters, but transforming the system matters even more. They work hand to hand. For all the great work being done around the world now, there is a basic, basic term pushed by the dominant culture and the oil industry that a person's contribution to the climate fight is large and is measured by their personal carbon footprint. And then we've all been here accused of our personal carbon footprint. Even up to now, whenever I say a word about you know, the climate crisis or sustainability, I'll soon be asked a question about how I drove to school today, or why I don't compost. Here's a tweet that goes back to 2015, where a group of kayak activists in Portland tried to block the path of an icebreaker that Shell was using to drill oil from the Arctic. As you can see here, instead of 
understanding the true context of the purpose. People were more focused on pointing out the irony and hypocrisy as the kayaks were made from petroleum. The thing is that in many cases, activists are just arguing that oil and gas subsidies from the government should be instead relocated to invest in renewable energy and technology. They aren't denying that we use petroleum products. No activists are denying that they use petroleum products because we all do. Instead, activists are just arguing that the, this fact itself is a problem and it needs systematic changes. They recognize that even if they could eliminate all petroleum products from their lives, it would make zero to no difference to the climate overall. Activists are usually just taking an attempt to initiate change in response to an ecological threat. So let me ask all of you here, who has told maybe more than once in their lives, or once or more, that they need, that you guys need to reduce your personal carbon footprint to become more green or become more sustainable. So when I calculated my first uh, carbon footprint annually uh, using the UN's carbon footprint calculator, I was shocked by how much dire emitted emissions I emitted on an annual basis from my meat consumption. You can see here around 64% of my diet is from meat consumption. So this realization has led me to have conversations with myself, with my parents, with my close friends, and we started to redirect and refocus that our diet. And right after that, I became a vegetarian and an inclusional vegetarian alongside my parents and few of my other close friends. The trick here is to think about a low carbon footprint not as an end goal itself, because after all, your carbon footprint is small or relatively very small considered to everything else that is disturbing our climate. Instead, we should use these calculations as a useful metric to identify which behavior changes are significant enough to really put pressure on the water system and which behavior changes are bad or unattractive, which then requires a systems level intervention. Now, although hypocrisy or accusations of hypocrisy are uncontrollable, are uncontrollable, especially in the mass media, there is a type of hypocrisy that we should be worried about. Hypocrisy as an abuse of power. We have seen too many events where a certain powerful medical industry or a government that holds political power does the complete opposite of a certain climate action which is committed to. Or in today's term, lip service. This is what we should all be calling out for instead. So perhaps calling out people for what they're not doing is simply just ineffective and counterproductive. Not only does it undermine you know, the credibility of the immediate target, but it also redirects the focus away from the societal level solutions that could bring change in the scale and pace that is needed. From my observation, it also makes people feel as if there is a criteria you know, to join the climate movement. One may ask, how can I, as an individual, demand an end to fossil fuels if I start a lineup to get my car to work? Or who am I to buy food waste when I'm eating a fancy dinner with my friends and I myself get picky and throw away food I don't like? Now this isn't the goal. The goal is to widen and include more people to join the climate movement and make it accessible and welcoming to everyone without no criteria. Now we see that Indonesia itself consists of over 270 million of Generation Z and millennials. That's a really big number, which in terms is also the dominant population of Indonesia right now. So you can imagine without many people, without many young people, what power we have is so huge. If we mobilize our collective individual actions to unlock systematic changes. But the lesson for those of us who are trying to mobilize on climate is not to only consider and validate what we should or shouldn't be doing, but instead to rethink why those actions matter. Just like what all environmental activists might wear to be stated, we need to think beyond the immediate and direct effect of our actions and ask more about the ripples they send up on a personal relationship, community, and society level. Remember once, as XR or even Greg Thunderbird or other activists in our generation rejected the value of living a lower carbon lifestyle. Nor have they have ever denied the unavoidable truth that you know, we all have to change our lifestyles in the next one or two decades. In fact, as of right now, I'm still committed to do my best to reduce my 
ecological impact of ideas today that I am for my lifestyle. And also to take the people around me to join the climate movement itself. So, in 2019, and you all remember here, uh, Greta Thunberg traveled across the Atlantic for a minute on a solar power panel in Singapore. Now, she did this to demonstrate her commitment to personal lives and changes. Her message, though, was that I'm not traveling like this because I want everyone to do so. I'm doing this to send a message that it is impossible to live sustainably today, and that needs to change. It needs to become much easier. So sustainability must be affordable. We have to make sustainability in default. To put it in another way, if the climate movement is going to continue to talk so much about you know, individual actions and our personal lives, then we need to get better at communicating its true value and to encourage people to see that very individual change through a collective lens of mass mobilization. We aren't on a quest to find the perfect free lifestyle. We're on a quest to create millions of innovative and transformative individual actions that will eventually change the system. That is why we're here. So ever since I've started my activism, the top one question that I would get from people is, how do I start? What is the first step in climate action? Now to tell you the truth, obviously there isn't a right or wrong answer for that. Climate action does not have a one size fits all. So my first suggestion for anyone looking to make a difference to start is not to make a top 10 list of how to cut your carbon footprint, but instead take a deep look in where you have the greatest opportunity to create lots of you know, change. So, in a better picture, um, here's one of my favorite diagrams uh, by Dr. Gerard that I love to refer to. You know, the Japanese seeking guideline diagram. Just think of this as a climate version focus on that. So, deep into your climate activism, ask yourselves. You know, what does your social network look like? And how can you have an influence to those you love? What issues, organizations, or activist groups that you are drawn to, and how can you get more involved in them? What opportunities do you have at work, at school, or even at your community? What power, privilege, do you enjoy that you can leverage in the service of an What strengths, skills, or knowledge do you want to bring to the climate fight? There's a big chance that all of us here have different skills and unique strengths that we can all contribute in your common action towards climate activism. So it's also important to ask, after you realize your strengths and skills, what do you love? Remember that you, know, you don't necessarily have to become scientists to contribute to the climate fight. We need lots and lots of people to contribute from their area of focus and from their area of expertise. And so crucially, the last step, or the last question that I'll offer you again, is what forces stands in your way? What challenges do you face? And what do you need to do to make those challenges go away? Second advice, now, because the climate crisis is a super complex problem. You know, we have all of these um, problems of issues within the environmental issue itself. Instead of trying to tackle all aspects of your you know, own lifestyle at once, I recommend first choosing a certain area that you want to focus on in environmentalism. All of this can all become very overwhelming if we try to focus on all of them at once. So maybe let's say you're passionate about composting. Look for ways in where you can take that passion and spread your influence to others by maybe starting a composting program at your school, for example, or teaching your co-workers. Or maybe you're passionate about climate policy. Invest academically and non-academically into programs that will sharpen your knowledge about policy making. Or get involved in your local government and policy infrastructures. Or maybe even stir up you know, peaceful democracy to demand outdated policies to get rid of in your country. Or maybe you're passionate about cutting back on meat consumption. Push for plant-based options to be available and dominant at your local school, or even at work. So once you know the knowledge and what you want to contribute to the climate movement, it's also time you normalize climate conversations with everyone you come across to. Sometimes unexpected things, you know, even from my experience, 
will happen just by talking to someone about a certain issue that they're most likely to be ignorant about. So by now it's hopefully and abundantly clear that I am not opposed to individual actions or individual change. As almost everyone I talk to about the climate movement, we all agree that there needs to be a need for both systems level change and changes that need to be made in our personal lives. It's just that the changes we make in our lives matter for a more purposeful meaning than a carbon footprint. We don't need more people to ride a bike because it will personal carbon footprint, we need them to do so because it will send a signal to politicians, businesses, fellow citizens, and planners. That signal, along with organized activism, will then in turn help to change the system from down to top. Similarly, we don't need every single activist or, single, or every environmentalist to become a vegan or a vegetarian. Yet we should embrace and applaud those vegans, those vegetarians, those flexitarians because their dietary choices are, sen are signaling and creating a culture where all people are more likely to eat plants. So here's a question to take home. How can each of us contribute to the crisis or to the problem if we are all also a tiny part of the problem that caused it itself? Perfect activism doesn't exist. So instead now I'm asking for millions of imperfect activists so we can create a perfect ripple of change. By embracing our hypocrisies, we can then weaken the arguments of our opponents who you know, use our imperfections as an excuse for doing nothing. The point here is not to ignore what we can and should be doing in our personal lives, Instead, it's to see those actions within its true context and how they both give meaning and power to help solve our problems. Each of us is an important and imperfect character to the story of the climate that is much larger and more complex than any one of us can ever imagine. So once we acknowledge that, that's when we can really start moving forward. Most of us are hypocrites in one way or another. So tell yourself that imperfect action is better than perfect inaction. So I ask all of you here, no matter where you are, no matter which position you're in, to join me as imperfect activists to start creating meaningful actions that will transform the system one day. And above all, it's time you get started on your own climate journey as well. Thank you.